Welcome to MedMark's webinar series. Today's presentation is titled, Human Body Meets Medical Device, Are We Biocompatible? I'm Kate Klaus, Senior Attorney in MedMark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of MedMark and today's presenter, Kevin Ong, thank you for joining us. Dr. Ong's expertise is product design evaluation, material selection, and failure analysis of medical devices, surgical instruments, and medical equipment with a focus on how patient, surgical and clinical, and device and design factors influence clinical performance, including device tissue interactions. He has experience with orthopedic, spine, fracture fixation, cardiovascular, and tissue reconstruction, and tissue repair medical devices from various perspectives, including product liability, intellectual property, regulatory and FDA compliance, product development, epidemiology, health economics, and technology assessment. He has directed preclinical and post market testing of bone and tissue to characterize biomaterials and medical devices, including wear testing and retrieval and exploit analysis. Dr. Ong is a registered professional engineer. Prior to joining Exponent, Dr. Ong was a research assistant in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Cornell University and the Cornell University Hospital for Special Surgery Program in Biomedical Mechanics. And with that, I am pleased to turn things over to Kevin. Thank you, Kate. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, wherever you may be residing. The biological risks and biocompatibility of medical devices and their materials is coming under increasing scrutiny with recalls, litigation, and vigilance from various regulatory agencies. For today's webinar, I'll be talking about how the guidances and standards for biocompatibility have evolved over time, as well as re recent FDA activities related to the biological safety of medical materials. If we look back in time, we have the silicon breast implant litigation of the 90s, where there were allegations of systemic diseases such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis resulting from the use of these implants. There was a class action lawsuit filed in 1992, and by the end of 1993, there were more than 12,000 lawsuits filed against Dow Corning. Dow eventually filed for bankruptcy in the mid-90s, and as part of their bankruptcy reorganization, they ended up settling these lawsuits for over $3 billion. Now, Dow was not alone in this, as there were other manufacturers as well, such as Bristol Myers Squibb and Bioplasty, who were also hit with lawsuits at that time. Now, if we fast forward to more recent times, surgical measures have also had allegations related to whether they are inert and whether they are biocompatible. Likewise, orthopedic implants, such as hip implants with metallic connections, have also come under the spotlight with discussions and controversy centered around whether they are biocompatible and whether they have resistance to corrosion, degradation, and wear. There have also been lawsuits uh, related to respiratory devices where there are claims of potential carcinogen and toxic chemical exposure leading to cancer and lung problems. Biological safety is also drawing increasing attention from the FDA. Although we talked earlier about the wave of breast implant lawsuits in the 90s, we also have regulatory attention where there have been uh, recalls that have been requested related to textured breast implants and tissue expanders. Additionally, potential biocompatibility concerns have also been raised related to corrosion and wear and how that might lead to pain and tissue changes for certain orthopedic devices made of specific materials. Now, we've been talking about biocompatibility and biological risk. What does all of this mean? How is biocompatibility defined? If we look to the international standards for biological assessments, and these standards are recognized by the FDA, biocompatibility has been defined as the ability of a medical device or material to perform with an appropriate host response in a specific situation. However, it's important to recognize also that these standards and the FDA acknowledge that there are individual patient reactions that 
some of these could be different even to the same material, and that it is possible that some patients may have adverse tissue reactions even to very well-established biocompatible materials. So why do we care about biocompatibility? Well, certainly it is, help, it is to help determine the potential toxicity of these materials and to help establish safety and effectiveness for these devices and the materials. Biocompatibility can be assessed in many different ways. Traditionally, we think about benchtop testing as well as preclinical testing in animals or humans. <clears throat> However, that's not always needed. The history of clinical use and scientific literature for some basic science information can also be used to help demonstrate the biocompatibility of the device. While biological safety assessments have a long history and spans across many different countries and regulatory agencies from the US Pharmacopoeia or USP to the US FDA to the European Union and international standard organizations. I'm going to be stepping through some of the highlights of these various standards and guidances, and it's important to recognize even the historical ones because often not many of these devices are based on historical information, and so therefore it's important to understand what types of guidances and standards were effective at the time that those products were developed. It's also good to look forward in time as well just to have an understanding of what additional guidances have been provided as a form of risk assessment. Now, when we switch to the US Pharmacopoeia or USP, um, before 1987, there were no recognized standards for device biological safety testing. Medical device manufacturers were looking for tests that seemed to be applicable, and the US Pharmacopoeia or USP had standards that were related to the quality and purity of medicines. Now that evolved over time to packaging and delivery systems to help evaluate the potential for chemicals to reach out. So many medical device companies were essentially using USP standards to help guide them, for example, with the assessments of products such as syringes, as well as sutures. Now, in terms of the USP, um, they look at six different classes of products, and we'll talk through about talk through some of these, but certainly the, the classes of products is based on the level of risk, with class six having to undergo the most tests or assessments, and class one the fewest. Now, these classes are designated based on the end use conditions and the type and time of exposure of the human tissue to the plastics, with, again, class six requiring the most stringent testing of them all. I won't go through all these in detail, but essentially, <clears throat> USP testing is typically not sufficient as a standalone for assessing medical device biocompatibility, although it is commonly used to designate a raw material as being safe for use in the manufacturing of medical devices. Typically, regulatory agencies will not accept just a USP certificate in lieu of international standards testing, which I'll be talking about shortly. Now, switching gears from the USP to the FDA, in 1987, that was when the first guidance document for biological safety assessment was published. And this is essentially called the Tripartite Biocompatibility Guidance, or G87-1. And this was a collaboration between Canada, the US, and the UK, where they wanted to develop a common approach for evaluating the toxicity of medical devices within those three jurisdictions. And what they wanted to do was to provide a framework for applying seven different principles for evaluating the potential for toxicity. And some of these included evaluating the final product, evaluating whether there are any potential leachables um, or degradation products, and also taking into consideration when there are changes to any physical form or chemical composition or manufacturing of these products. And similar to the USP that we just talked about, one key element of the tripartite guidance document is the device categorization. 
where it's formally introduced based on the nature and duration of contact. And I'll talk about this in a little more detail. The tripartite guidance also introduced additional biological tests, such as those related to red blood cells and skin uh, mutation, uh, mucose irritation. <coughs> as far as the device categorization, this again is based in accordance with the type of contact the device is anticipated to make with the body. And this would fall under four main categories with a number of them having subcategories as well. Starting with non-contacting devices, and this was not contemplated in the USP. This would include in, in vitro diagnostic devices. Another class of devices are external devices that would contact intact skin. For example, those would include devices like electrodes. You can also have external devices that may contact compromised surfaces or breach surfaces of the body. So those would include things like dressings for ulcers and burns. We also have externally communicating devices. So these are devices that would contact from the external to the internal portions of the body. And these can happen through, these can happen through um, intact natural channels. So for example, the contact lens or urinary catheters that would go from the outside to the inside um, of the body. We also have other types of externally uh, communicating devices such as those that will have an indirect contact with the blood path. So this would be where it would contact one point and be a conduit for fluid entry into the blood path. For example, um, this would include things like blood administration set. We also have blood paths that are direct. So this would be recirculating devices, such as IV catheters and dialysis tubing. Then we get to implantable devices, those that may contact bone, like joint, joint replacement devices, plates and screws. Then we also have tissue and tissue fluid contacting devices. Those would include devices such as surgical meshes. Then we also have implantable devices that will contact blood, and devices such as heart valves will fall under that category. Now, the intended use of the device will dictate the potential risk from the standpoint of, as I talked about earlier, the type of contact whether it's contacting skin, something internal like the urinary tract, all the way to something that may be more of an organ like the brain. Now, the other aspect too is the duration of contact that also comes into play in terms of how risk is assessed. We have transient contact, which is considered anything less than five minutes, to short term, which is anything between five minutes and 29 days, all the way to long term, use, which is anything from 30 days onwards. And these will all dictate the breadth of evaluations that will be considered as part of the assessment. So the greater the risk, the greater the breadth of evaluations. Now, switching gears, in the early 90s, we also start to get into more international standardization with the International Standard Organization, or ISO. And that's where they introduced the ISO 10993 standard, which is the Biological Evaluation of Medical Devices. The intent here is to harmonize testing standards among various participating agencies and nations. And it's seen as a consensus standard, but may still not be sufficient depending on the individual agency's regulations. The ISO standard was first published in 1992, and it provided a guidance for the selection of various types of tests. And over time, this has been assessed and reviewed and updated um, with that happening in 1997 and 2003. Now we get to a, an update in 2009 
which was critical because that was when a risk-based approach was first described. So the term risk for, appears for the first time in the ISO standard. And rather than being focused on conducting tests, it became more focused on understanding the risks of the materials and the device to assess whether additional evaluations needed to be conducted. Then in 2018, which is the most recent update of the ISO standard, we get into more detailed and extended descriptions of the types of evaluations and characterizations. And these would include uh, considerations for things like nanomaterials, so submicron materials, as well as absorbable materials. Now, in the ISO standard, that's also where we start to see the definitions for biological risk and biological safety. So if you look at the aim of the standards, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they do call for the protection of humans from potential biological risks arising from the use of medical devices. And the scope of the assessment is to evaluate the biological safety of the medical device. And here they describe biological risk as being a combination of the probability of harm to health due to any adverse reactions associated with the device or the material, as well as the severity of that harm. So not only the probability of harm, but also the severity of harm. And biological safety is considered to be the freedom from unacceptable biological risk in the context of its intended use. So now we switch gears from ISO standards, and we also start to see over time the European Union getting into the act of evolving, evolving their approach to regulating medical device biocompatibility. And this started out with the Medical Device Directive in 1993, which was then subsequently updated in 2007. And if we look at the EU Medical Device Directive, they don't actually explicitly mention biocompatibility, but they do call out that particular attention must be paid to the materials as, as far as the choice of materials and the toxicity of the material and that there should be compatibility between the material and biological tissues, cells, and bodily fluids. They also describe trying to minimize the risk posed by contaminants and residuals, and also taking into account the type of tissue, duration, and, ex and frequency of exposure. So this is very similar to what we saw earlier with the FDA tripartite guidance, where we talked about the different categories of devices. And although we saw earlier that the ISO 10993 standard came about and was published in 1992, the EU Medical Device Directive, which came a year later, makes no explicit mention of the ISO standard. And then over time, the FDA also evolved and ended up developing their own guidance, which replaced the 1987 FDA tripartite biocompatibility guidance. So what is the FDA guidance? Well, in 1995, they ended up replacing the tripartite G87 memo with what's called the G95 Blue Book Memorandum. And what they did was they actually recognized the ISO 10993 guidance and wanted to better harmonize what was being done in the ISO standard or prescribed by the ISO standard to the FDA um, application. And then subsequently in 2016, recognizing that ISO was continuing to update their guidances in 2009 and 2018, the FDA introduced a new biocompatibility guidance uh, with the draft in 2016, which was then finalized in 2020, which further expanded on the ISO 10993 guidance and also described considerations for the use of novel materials and manufacturing processes. 
We also talk about use of specific endpoints and recommendations for how samples should be provided. I think what's also unique to the FDA guidance document is providing considerations for hazards from uh, mechanical failure. So these would include fa failures and potential failures such as coating delamination, which could then potentially leach out chemicals. There was discussion around considerations for those types of hazards. And certainly adopting what was done in, by ISO in 2009, the FDA guidance also started to use a risk-based approach to determine if additional testing was needed. Now, the FDA provided guidance for the sources of information to use for risk assessment to determine the toxicity risk for different materials. So for example, they provided um, guidance that material standards could be used. So this is where material standards, which provide uh, for the type of material composition, could be used to help direct um, the potential for biocompatibility risk. They also described the use of previously reviewed devices, such as predicate devices or other PMA experiences that could be used to help inform whether there's any potential new risk introduced by the present device or material. Certainly, the use of literature to evaluate and help identify any potential for byproducts, as well as any levels at which those byproducts may be considered to be potentially um, sick. So the use of literature can help guide that as well. Then certainly in terms of the use of clinical experience to help mitigate any unexpected findings or to help drive a further understanding of the history of the use of the material. And lastly, animal studies can also be used to help assess the risk and this is particularly important in terms of being able to assess the outcomes from clinically relevant implant sites based on how the device is intended to be used. Then lastly, we get to back to the uh, European Union where the EU MDR or EU Medical Device Regulation uh, transition began in 2017. And that's where we start to see the EU become more compliant with the ISO 10993. But they also added additional requirements related to what kind of thresholds they expect for certain substances in terms of the concentration, unless they're justified. They also start to talk about devices that may be incorporating human tissue or cells. And something that's not necessarily as explicit in the ISO standards, the EU MDR also provided additional considerations for endocrine disrupting substances, <clears throat> as well as nanomaterials, which we saw in the FDA guidance, and devices that are composed of absor absorbable material, which again we saw in the FDA guidance document. Now, now, switching gears and focusing on recent activities from the FDA, we certainly have seen the FDA start to pay additional attention to materials used in medical devices. And back in 2019, there was a statement from then FDA Commissioner and still current Director of CDRH that issued a statement related to the evaluation of materials that are used for medical devices and their potential safety risk. And what they wanted to do was they were initially concerned about a small number of patients who may have biological responses to certain type of materials that are used in implantable devices. And although these symptoms may be related to where the devices may be implanted, they were concerned that they that these symptoms may not develop for several years and may be limited to a small subset of patients. So they wanted to have a better understanding of that. And to direct that, they really want to enhance the material science 
research to help identify materials that may cause an exaggerated response in sensitive individuals and advance the development of safer materials. And lastly, because they were in the process of updating their guidance, they wanted to announce that they were in the process of finalizing those guidance um, documents that they were developing related to the updates from ISO 10993. So they wanted to help ensure that medical device manufacturers have adequately assessed the potential for their device to, to potentially cause adverse biological responses in patients. An additional area of emphasis that was placed by the FDA relates to the safety of metals and other materials that are used in medical devices. They wanted to describe to the industry and to healthcare professionals about how the FDA considers the safety of materials. And they wanted to explain the role of, of how they were evaluating data related to post-market data related to certain metal containing implants. And those implants that were mentioned by the FDA included certain types of hip replacements as well as intrauterine devices. And lastly, they also issued a white paper that described the ongoing science around the potential for biological responses to metal implants. And I'll talk about this shortly. So if we look at the white paper that the FDA published, this was published in September 2019, what the FDA really wanted to understand was how a patient's immune system may respond to metal. And does the response produce clinically significant signs, symptoms, or adverse outcomes? And I'll talk through some of the highlights of this white paper. A number of areas of interest to the FDA related to the potential for biological responses to metal implants include the potential for susceptibility to corrosion and metal ion release. The FDA was particularly interested in better understanding how the physiological environment, such as changes in the acidity or pH of the environment, could potentially relate to the risk of metal ion release. They also wanted to better understand the interactions mechanically between the components of the device. For example, if you have a multi-component device, could that be potential for wearing away of those surfaces, and could that potentially release ions? As far as active implants go, so these are implants that rely on electrical stimulation. And is that introduction of an electrical current, does that affect the potential for ion release? And lastly, they were also interested in better understanding how manufacturing or processing such as the addition of a surface finish. Could that increase the resistance of metals to corrosion? The FDA also had particular interest in orthopedic devices as far as whether the reaction to metal could potentially lead to bone loss. They're also interested in neurological devices because these typically would, again, involve the use of electrical pulses. So devices such as electrodes, nitinol coils, could that have any potential effect on the electrical signals in the brain? And many of those types of devices also contain nickel. And could there be a potential for nickel ion to be liberated during their use? Then we get also to the um, area of cardiovascular devices. Could there be a potential that there would be an activation of the platelets in the blood and whether that could potentially lead to clotting when these devices are used? Now, the FDA was also interested in understanding whether coatings applied to these devices may help negate or reduce the response. You also get to oral implants, 
where oral and dental implants with the potential for microbial colonization or bacterial colonization in the implant, and whether that may also play a role in inciting inflammatory responses or biological responses. Then we also get to urogenital devices. So for example, contraceptive devices. And many of those, again, do contain uh, copper. And so there's a you know, question being asked by the FDA about whether the presence of copper could lead to the release um, while, while they're in use. Now, when we get to some of the additional highlights from the white paper, I'd like to point to the section related to the clinical response to metal implants. There are a few notable statements that I'd like to highlight here, which are the recognition by the FDA that the clinical response is very complicated and that there's no simple explanation when patients have a biological response to metal implants. They recognize the importance of individual patient susceptibility. And they also state that the determination of whether the metal caused the systemic response is often not possible. Other notable state statements also include their recognition that the mechanisms underlying the biological responses to metal implants are not fully understood because it's often very difficult to distinguish between patient and device-related factors. However, they also do recognize that there are limitations with how corrosion is, is typically performed under idealized conditions, which enables comparisons between devices, but it makes it unclear as far as how to relate the test conditions to how the device may behave in the body. But again, typically these are not done in isolation and there are other considerations that are conducted to better assess that. The FDA also recognizes that even the biocompatibility assessments do present some limitations as far as trying to evaluate the device safety and effectiveness. Now, switching gears here, in more recent times, so we talked about the FDA activities in the, in the late 2010 period. Then we get to 2021, where, so this was almost a year ago, where the FDA published material safety data. And what they did was they wanted to better understand the safety profiles for a number of materials that are commonly used in, plant, in implantable devices and they wanted to understand the effects of those materials on patients over time. What the FDA did was they commissioned ECRI, which is a nonprofit organization. So ECRI stands for Emergency Care Research Institute. And the number of materials that drew the FDA's attention as far as studying the material safety. And these include magnesium, so these are devices, so these are materials that are sometimes used in stents, sometimes in orthopedic devices. We also have polyurethane, oh, sorry, polypropylene, which are sometimes which are used in surgical meshes as well as other materials. Other materials also include polyurethanes. These can be used in catheters, balloons. We also have the use of uh, siloxanes or silicon. Again, sometimes these are used in breast implants. We have a type of polyester or PET, and those can be used in surgical meshes, it can be used in sutures and other types of devices. The FDA was also interested in resolvable materials such as PEG or polyethylene glycol, and those are typically coatings uh, materials used on stents and catheters. Silver was also another material that drew the FDA's attention as far as its use as an antimicrobial agent. There were also acrylic type materials, such as those used in dental resins that the FDA was interested in. 
And then lastly, we have bioresolvable bio polymers, such as PLA or PGA, that also drew the FDA's attention. And what I'd like to do is touch on what these ECRI summaries or ECRI reports and, and what these material reviews focused on. So there were really five questions related to the local and systemic response that the FDA was interested in. They wanted to better understand what is the typical or expected local host response to the material. They wanted to understand if the material would elicit a persistent or exaggerated response that may lead to systemic signs or symptoms beyond what's already known. They wanted to also better understand whether there are any patient-related or material-related factors that could either predict, increase, or decrease the likelihood of that exaggerated response as it existed. <clears throat> and they also wanted to understand if there were any critical information gaps that exist and what researchers needed to better understand this issue. So I'd like to pull up one of, the, one of these ECRI reports, and these are downloadable from the FDA website. I would certainly encourage you, especially if you are working on a device or have a device that is using any one of those materials that were listed earlier on the, on the previous slide, that I would highly recommend looking at these reports just to have a better understanding, um, if you don't already, of some of the information that the FDA has collected related to material safety. So here's an example of one for polyurethane. <clears throat> and I'll pull out the table of contents here so that you can see what kind of information the FDA is looking at. Not only did they look at the scientific and clinical literature, but they also considered post-market surveillance data and safety alerts. So because ECRI is what's known as a patient safety organization, or PSO, they have collected over 3.5 million safety events and reports from close to 2,000 healthcare provider organizations. However, even though they have these many reports and events that they've collected, only approximately 4% are related to medical devices. And what ECRI did was they reviewed their PSO data and included that as part of their assessment in these reports. Now, if we look at the tables and some of the data that they provided in, the, in these tables, what they really wanted to do was, with the literature, was to really understand and better understand what the animal and human study showed as far as the material itself and the potential health effects from the materials, but also how those materials were used in very specific types of devices and whether there was any potential for any health effects. As far as the polyurethane evaluation went, ECRI included 82 articles in their review. And what they found that was that there was moderate evidence for mild inflammation, catheter dysfunction, phlebitis or the inflammation of the vein, and thrombosis or blood clots as potential local responses. But they did note that it was unclear whether device malfunctions related to biocompatibility or device integrity. And they also found that there were no studies that investigated systemic reactions. And when ECRI went through their PSO data or their post-market surveillance data, they found that the most common complication in their data related to polyurethane was for device, quote, device malfunction or failure. And they recognized that there were some evidence gaps related to patient or material-related factors for local responses. So again, you know, if, if you do have, um, if you are investigating these materials that, that I mentioned earlier in the, in, in the earlier slides, I do recommend that, that you take a look at those reports. So in summary, biocompatibility relates to the ability of a device material to perform with an appropriate host response based on the specific situation. This does not preclude 
some patients from experiencing adverse tissue reactions, even to very well-established biocompatible materials. And more recently, biocompatibility risks are assessed using a risk-based approach and a risk management approach, which does not always necess necessitate testing, especially when you have uh, prior applicable data or experience that exists that can help inform the potential biological safety risk for that material or device. It's also taken into consideration in terms of a risk-benefit approach in terms of whether um, the benefits provided by the device outweigh the risk provided by or produced by the material. And I think it's important that the FDA also recognizes that biocompatibility, and they do call this out in their guidance, that biocompatibility is only one of a number of design characteristics, and that they caution about selecting a material based solely on its biocompatibility because it might result in a less functional device. So again, you know, it's important to consider the device holistically and not just consider the biological response to a material in isolation from the overall design. And that is something that the FDA has certainly focused on in their guidance. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, we do have a, a few questions for you from our listeners. Um, first, after the Dow Corning litigation, what are the current thoughts on the safety and effectiveness of silicone rubber in long-term and permanent implants? Yeah, I know that um, rubber has been used and has been studied in a number of different implantable devices. Um, certainly, it's been considered, based on my experience, I've seen it being considered for the use of articulating materials. So things that, you know, when I, when I say that, it, it refers to materials that are going to be rubbing up against another material. And I think at the end of the day, again, coming back to the holistic approach and the risk-based approach, having an understanding of um, the historical context, obviously, but also just understanding what the particular formulation, because again, everything is very, it can be very specific. It's, it's all taken on a case basis. And understanding how that specific manufacturing process and the processing of that particular material that's of interest for that application and looking at the tests and the test results and seeing what that shows, I think that all needs holistic view to, to set up whether they might be. Okay. Um, next, uh, are regulators concentrating on specific substances now rather than common materials that are used across the medical device landscape? Yeah, I mean, I, I spoke earlier about some materials. I think there were nine on that list, you know, that would include magnesium, polypropylene, polyurethane. Certainly, the FDA has been engaged in performing additional research in, with regards to those types of materials. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that it's not necessarily only limited to the materials because there are also uh, some, some classes or types of devices, as I mentioned earlier, that the FDA has been trying to further evaluate, such as neurological devices, you know, I talked earlier about the uh, intrauterine devices as well. I think the other areas where we've seen some growth as well is, certainly we've heard a lot about 3D printed materials, 3D printed devices. I think that's also another area where having an understanding of, are there any differences in the raw material and whether changing the process? Because again, if you're thinking about for example, historically, where you may be machining a material, um, where you may be machining a material versus having the material now in a slightly different form where you may need to extrude it or spray it or process it differently just so that you can layer the 3D structure in a 3D printed form, you know, does that change the risk? And so I think having, you know, with 3D printed materials, I think that's where something, um, just ha at least having an understanding of whether any additional risks may be introduced uh, would also be an important um, 
assessment of performance. Uh, would you say there are any recent trends of importance that you've come across? Yeah, I think I think we do certainly have an increasing emphasis on better understanding how the individual patient hypersensitivity comes into play. We use metal ions as an example. Mm -hmm. Example from the medical literature that some in I think we're losing Kevin a little bit. Yeah, the audio seems to be cutting in and out a little bit. Yeah, Kevin, your audio is going in and out again. So could you just repeat that final statement? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think what, what we're seeing here is an increasing emphasis on better understanding individual patient hypersensitivity. And if we look, for example, at met metal ions as an, as an example, uh, we see in the medical literature that there are some individuals who may have a reaction even to very low levels of metal ions. But on the other hand, we also see individuals who may have relatively higher levels, but they have no reaction at all. So I, I think that's certainly something uh, at, in terms of an area of interest, uh, certainly to the FDA as well, because as, as you heard earlier, the FDA has stated that you know we have individuals who re react even to well-established materials. So I think patient hypersensitivity and how that relates to materials and reactions to materials is certainly an area of ongoing research. Okay, we have another question for you, the kind of a two-part question. Uh, what has been the impact of the recent EU MVR's introduction of CMR substances on biocompatibility regulations? And do you think that these and other environmental hazardous substances um, will be introduced in uh, ISO 10993? Can you, can you please repeat that? Yep. Uh, so they're asking about the impact. First, the impact of uh, EU MDR's introduction of CMR substances on biocompatibility regulations. Uh, and second, whether you think that bees and any other environmental hazardous substance regulations uh, will become part of ISO 10993. Yeah, I mean, so firstly, in terms of the assessments with regards to EU MDR, I mean, some, some of that certainly relates to um, not only assessing the, the biocompatibility risk, but also just having an understanding of what the potential limits are for from in terms of toxicolo uh, toxicological exposure. And that's certainly something that, you know, can be done from the standpoint of not necessarily relating to uh, the need for testing. Because again, because it's a risk-based approach, um, there are certainly ways to assess the theoretical limits or thresholds for uh, toxic reactions, and I know that you know that's something that's an area where our firm and our group has done in terms of looking at what's the constituents of the material, what's the chemical composition, how much of that is present, and then assessing that relative to what the typical daily exposure is to a human, just even without the device. And just making that comparison. So that's a way to assess the risk and, and assess whether there's a potential for uh, toxic reactions or not. And as far as how that relates to ISO 10993, I think mean, holistically, if you look at ISO 10993, um, you know, from the standpoint of how you look, you look at the device holistically in terms of making sure that the manufacturing process is taken into account. You look at the product in its final form and performing all the various um, tests if needed, as well as looking at the historical use of the material, all of that can be used as evidence or information to help guide whether there are potentially any new risks that are introduced or not. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of our questions and answers. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for your time today. This has been really great information. I think will be very valuable for our audience.
We, You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.